What's up, peers, and welcome to the World Crypto Network, here with a reading of the absolutely recommended Bitcoin Optech newsletter. Thank you very much to all the supporters and contributors to this phenomenal open source group. Today, newsletter number six, July 31st, 2018. This week's newsletter includes the usual dashboard and action items, a feature article by developer Anthony Towns about consolidating 4 million UTXOs at Xapo, news about possible upgrades at Bitcoin script language, links to a few highly voted questions and answers on the Bitcoin Stack Exchange, and some notable commits in the development branch of the Bitcoin Core Lightning Network daemon, LND, and C Lightning projects. Action items. Bitcoin Core version 0.16.2 is released, a minor release that brings bugs fi bug fixes and minor improvements. It is it, if you use the abandoned transaction or verified TX outproof RPCs, you should particularly consider upgrading. Otherwise, we recommend you, you review the release notes for other changes that may affect your operation and upgrade when convenient. Dashboard items. Fees are still low. Hash rate increased difficulty by more than 14% in the last 2016 block retargeting period ending Saturday, given an average time between blocks of 8 minutes and 41 seconds. This helped to absorb the increasing transaction load from the past week's price speculation. Immediately following a difficulty retarget, the average time between blocks is restored to 10 minutes. As we transition away from the normal weekend transaction lull into a new week, there is the possibility of a rapid increase in estimated transaction fees. We recommend being careful spending large, low-fee transactions, such as consolidations, until a closer look until closer to the weekend when transaction volumes begin to taper off again. Field report. Consolidating 4 million, 4 million UTXOs. Example by Anthony Towns, developer on Bitcoin Core and Xapo. As mentioned in newsletter three, the past few months of low transaction fees make it a great time for UTXO consolidation. Consolidation has been one of a variety of activities XAPO has been undertaking to be prepared for the next time fees spike, likely like they did in the last months of 2017. Here you see a chart or a plot of the total Bitcoin UTXOs from January to July 2016, which is phenomenal. The idea behind UTXA, UTXO consolidation is essentially this. When your average outgoing payment is larger than your average incoming payment, or when they're the same but you're batching outgoing payments, you'll often have to combine many UTXOs in order to fund an outgoing transaction, which increases the size of your transaction and hence the fee you pay. By consolidating UTXOs in advance, you can combine inputs ahead of time, giving you more control over when the most of those out costs are incurred. If you can do it when fees are low, that lets you reduce those costs pretty sustainably. Substantially, sorry. For example, if you would have spent a dozen two out of three multi-sig inputs at 100 Satoshi per byte, that would cost around 360,000 Satoshis. While if you consolidate those inputs beforehand at two Satoshi per byte and then spend a single consolidated input later at 100 Satoshi per byte, your total cost of the two transactions is only 41 Satoshis per byte. That is, and now stay seated, that is intense, 87% less paid in fees. And if fees don't rise that high, don't, 
And if fees don't rise, the risk isn't huge. If fees just stay at two Satoshis per byte, you'd be spending 7,900 Satoshis across two transactions if you consolidate, rather than spending 7,200 Satoshis in a single transaction if you did nothing. Considering consolidation also gives an opportunity to update the addresses you use for your UTXOs. For example, to roll keys over, switch to multisig, or switch to SegWit or BAC32 addresses. And reducing the number of UTXOs makes it easier to run a full node too, marginally improving Bitcoin's decentralization and overall security, which is always nice. Of course, one thing you really don't want to have happen is for your consolidated transactions to somehow fill up the blockchain and cause fees to immediately start rising. There are two metrics to watch to avoid this risk. One is whether the mempool is full, which causes the minimum accepted fee to rise, and the other is how much empty space there has been in recent blocks which gives an indication of whether miners will, have, will accept more transactions at a minimum fee. Both these metrics have been very promising most of the time over the past few months. The mempool has regularly been close to empty, meaning that transactions paying little, as little as one Satoshi per byte have propagated to miners, and many blocks have not been full meaning cheap consolidation transactions will get mined reasonably quickly rather than creating a backlog that will cause fees to rise. The approach we took to actually doing the consolidation was to have a script that would select groups of small UTXOs and create a consolidation transaction spending them to a single pool address at a fee rate of 1.01 Satoshis per byte. The script gradually feeds consolidating transactions into the network so it doesn't cause too large a spike in the mempool. And perhaps more importantly, so we didn't risk having our transactions get dropped because they have low fees and the mempool has filled up. We trigger this manually when we were comfortable it wouldn't interfere with our operations and when there didn't seem to be much load on the Bitcoin network in general. All in all, this has worked out pretty well. We're reducing our UTXO set by something like, again, 4 million UTXOs this year. And aside from some concerned Redditors, the cost of the network as a whole was being minimal, <laughs> as has the cost to us. Now I have to be, like, I was one of these concerned tweeters, not Redditors, because uh, I was checking out the mempool and concerned that all of a sudden there was this gradual increase by all 1.01 Satoshi per byte transactions until I checked out the optech and then I understood what was happening. Additional resources. Techniques on reducing transaction fees, consolidation in the Bitcoin wiki, how to cheaply consolidate coins to reduce mining fields, also in the Bitcoin Wiki, and what are some best practices regarding the usage of consolidation uh, and fanouts at BitGo. News. Improvements in the Bitcoin scripting language by Peter Woolley. A talk last given a high-level overview of several possible near-term improvements to Bitcoin. We highly recommend watching the video viewing the slides and reading the transcript referred by Brian Bishop. But if you're too busy, here's Woolley's conclusion. My initial focus here is Schnorr signatures and Taproot. The reason for this focus is that the ability to make any input and output in the cooperative case look identical is an enormous win for how script execution works. Schnorr is necessary for this because without it, we cannot encode multiple parties into a single key. Having multiple branches in there is a relatively simple change. If you look at the consensus changes necessary for these things, it is really remarkable stuff. Dozens of lines of codes. It looks like 
of, it looks like a lot of complexity is in explaining why these things are useful and how to use them and not so much in the impact on the consensus rules. Things like aggregation, I think, are something that can be done after we have explored various options for structural improvements to the scripting language. Once it is clear around what the structuring should be, because we will probably learn from the developments how these things get used in practice, that's, that's what I'm working on with a number of collaborators and will hopefully be proposing something soon. And that's the end of my talk. It was a fantastic talk and I encourage you again to watch the entire video. Selected Q&A from the Bitcoin Stack Exchange. Bitcoin Stack Exchange is one of the first places Optech contributors look for answers to their questions or when we have a few spare moments of time to help answer other people's questions. In this new monthly feature, we highlighted some of the top voted questions and answers made there in the past month. The first is on Schnorr versus ECDSA. The question. Let me make this a bit larger. I understand that Schnorr signatures provide an improvement on ECDSA, elliptical curve digital signature algorithm, in that they are a fixed 64 bytes instead of the longer ECDSA signature format. However, I don't see how this is an advantage over ECDSA in any situation except multisig. With ECDSA, transactions can be signed and verified without needing to include the signer's public key in the message. However, Schnorr, as described in the recent BIP, doesn't have that advantage, which means that for any transaction not from a multi-sig address, the necessary space to store all data necessary for verification would be 26 byte cheaper under ECDSA assuming a 64-byte Schnorr signature with a 33-byte compression compressed public key versus a roughly 71-byte ECDSA SIG without a public key. And again, it's actually 72 if you consider the worst case. Go back to last week's newsletter. With regards to that, why is Schnorr receiving such a focus? Do multi-sig transactions make up enough of Bitcoin's load that Schnorr would be that significant? And why has there been little to no focus on implementing transactions without storing public keys, which Ethereum has been doing all along? Really good question by Lev Knopblock. And the answer here proposed by Peter Woolley, the author of the BIP itself. Your question seemed to assume that the only goal is minimizing on-chain transaction size, reducing size and related costs is certainly something that can be improved upon, but it is far from the only thing that primary advantage of Schnorr proposals are. First, better privacy. By making different multi-sig spending policies indistinguishable on chain when combining with Taproot, this extends to pretty much all cooperative execution of contracts, which, belong, which become just a single signature on chain. Regardless of complexity or number of participants, enabling simpler high-level protocols such as atomic swaps that are indistinguishable from nominal payments. These can be used to build more efficient payment channels constructions. Third, improving verification speed by supporting batch validation of all signatures in a block at once for a transaction of the speed of validating them individually. Switching to a provably secure construction, perhaps preventing an, employ, an exploit against ECDSA in the future. As far as your specific suggest suggestion of using public key recovery to avoid publishing the public key in a, in a spend goes, there are some arguments against. First, Public key recovery is incompatible with batch validation. And when ignoring batch validation, it is slightly slower than the normal validation on itself. 
Second, there may be patents that apply to public key recovery. Nonsense, intellectual property, open source, everything. Damn it. Fourth, the same size savings can be accomplished more simply by using pay to pub key instead of pay to pub key hash. Again, when combining with Taproot, this advanced ex extends to scripts as well as single key constructions. And fourth, longer, longer term cross input signatures aggregation holds much better potential size savings by reducing the total number of signatures per transaction, not just transaction input. To number one, cross input aggregation is also incompatible with public key recovery, though this isn't currently included in the Schnorr proposal. Also, note that the lack of public key recovery isn't inherent to Schnorr. It is a result of choosing key prefixes Schnorr. It's better to see it as a trade-off between three properties. One, linearity, the ability to jointly produce a signature for the sum of public keys, the basis for all Schnorr multi-signature construction. Two, lag of the key malleability, which with key malleability, is, it is possible to take a signature for an existing public key and turn it into a signature for a related key. For example, one in the same BIP32 tree. BIP32 is hierarchical deterministic wallets. And third, public key recovery. The ability to construct a public key from a, single, from a signature and message. The key prefix Schnorr lacks public key recovery. Non-key pref prefix Schnorr suffer from key malleability. And ECDSA lacks linearity. It doesn't seem possible to construct a signature scheme that has all three. That was a very, very dense uh, answer here by Peter Woolley. Thank you very much for providing that. Next question. BIP32, child key derivation stops working after a certain index. Here's my code to get a child public key from a parent hierarchical deterministic key. I adapted it from the freedom node. I'm not going to go through this code here, but go directly to the question. If I use it for the index zero or one or two, pass zero, 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 one, or zero, two, it works fine in the sense that if I send Bitcoin to that address, I can see the transaction on the public blockchain under the parent, xpub, on blockchain.com. You should use blockstream.info or your own node, even better. And it shows the funds plus the child address, which I generate, match the shown up in my Celium HD account receiving address. But when I use index 243, thus creating a path for 0, 2, 4, 3, I, it did not show up in the receiving end under that XPUB, even though it, XPUB is extended public key, even though it showed up on my sending end as a confirmed transaction. That path, 0, 243, generated a valid Bitcoin address, but it did not show up under the extended public key on blockchain.com, even after it was confirmed. What's the rule involved? If i is larger than some limit, is it, does it no longer work? Or if I use an index out of order, does it, it doesn't work? Or something else, like mycelium stopping recognizing child addresses past a certain index i, and, re, and really the funds SAFA just under a higher level new HD XPUB. I used the same code to generate all the child addresses for I0, 1, 2, and 243. That's a question proposed by Todd Mill. And here we have a answer by Victor T. Mycelium hierarchical deterministic is BIP44 compliant. As specified in BIP44, the address gap limit is 20. This means that after 20 indi indices, 
of unused addresses, the wallet expects that no more addresses are used beyond that point. Therefore, if you send funds to an address with a gap of more than 20 indices between the last used address, the wallet software will not check if that address has received any funds. So thank you very much, uh, Victor, for these answers. And just to be clear, no Bitcoin were lost. They just did not show up in the, in the wallet software. However, here Todmo still has access to the private key derived at index 243, which he can then manually use uh, or specify uh, as a new starting point and then uh, spend the Bitcoin as usual. Uh, I would suggest the Electrum wallet uh, for setting the specific derivation path, uh, which will then show up in a new wallet. Next question. What is the maximum size of a DER encoder for ECDSA signature? I've been told by a seasoned Bitcoin contributor that signatures in Bitcoin could be, could be up to 75 bytes. I'm curious to find out how the maximum comes to pass. According to this answer on why signature is always 65 bytes long, the signature is always six bytes plus the length of R and S. R is a random number, S is the signature. There where the later two can be used, can be up to 33 bytes. Is that accurate? Is that the worst case? that would result in a length of 72 bytes. Can signatures be longer than 72 bytes? And under what circumstances does that happen? And what is the maximum? The question is proposed by Merch. And the answer uh, by, uh, initially by Peter Woolley and then edited by a coding enthusiast. A signature in Bitcoin as used to sign transactions inside the script SIG and script witnesses consists of DER encoded encoding of the ECDSA signature plus a SIG hash type byte. Overall, this means they consist of the DER encoding signature data, which consists of one byte type 0x30, which is a compound object the tuple of the random number and signature values, the one byte length of the compounded object, the signatures R value consisting of the one byte type 0x02 integer, a one byte length of the integer, and a variable length R value bytes. The signatures S value consists of one byte type of 0x02 integer, and a one, type, one byte length of the integer plus a variable length S values byte, the SIG hash and the SIG hash type byte. Summing this all up, we have seven bytes, which is a compound header, a compound length, the random value header, the signature value length, the signature value header, the signature value length, and the SIG hash type byte excluding the actual random number and the signature data bytes. So we have reduced the question to wondering what the size of R and S data bytes are. These encoded 256-bit values, which ordinarily means 20, uh, 32 bytes. However, integers in DER are assigned, which means that if their height, if their highest bit is set, they are interpreted as negative. For that reason, if the value being encoded is two to the power of 228, a 33 byte is added in front. A 33rd byte, so one additional byte. There is a standardness rule on the network that requires this S value to be below N divided by two, where N is being the SACP 256K curve order lower s. But no such rule exists for r. Furthermore, it is only a standardness rule which miners are allowed to bypass, so it's not a consensus rule. So ignoring the lower s rule, signatures, including the SIG hash type byte, can be set up to 7 plus 33 plus 33 
which is the, 30, the 73 bytes, which we talked about the last couple uh, newsletters. Perhaps the number you're citing also includes the push opcode used in the script stick to push the signature onto the stack. But that still only gets us to 74 bytes. Perhaps the 75th byte is the length of the script stick itself, but that would only be re relevant for script six, which cons consists of just a signature, for example, pay to public key spends. Again, phenomenal in-depth answer. I hope I didn't lose you there. Um, but this just explains that the maximum amount can be 73 bytes, uh, although it might be just 72, uh, when here this value is not negative. Next question. What, what's the use of non-relaying, non-standard transactions if anyone can still use them using pay to script hash? This is a question uh, asked by boot for life It seems that non-standard transactions are not normally relayed because there is a concern this might break the network or it might it, it might make future upgrades harder. But anyone can use these non-standard transactions and get them relayed using pay to script hash. So what's good? So what good is the restriction of non-pay to script hash scripts? And that is an answer by David Harding, who is also a regular contributor to the Bitcoin Optech newsletter. As you say, there are two separate concerns here. One, there are some scripts that might cause harm to the network. And two, there are some scripts that might make future upgrades harder. For that use, for the case of harm to the network, non-standard transactions check what was first implemented by Nakamoto before pay to script hash existed. So it could be so easily circumvented. This gave developers time to better analyze the script language and fix problems with the remaining opcodes. For example, see changes like this, where it was possible to create a transaction that would take very long time to verify a denial of service attack, potentially. However, even if the scripting language is perfectly safe, each script has to be stored by every full node until it spends as part of the unspent transaction output database. Since script pub keys are limited to 10,000 bytes, this means that an attacker can add up to 10 kilobytes to the UTXO set for every output he creates, potentially quickly adding enough data to degrade performance enough that the rate of stale blocks or orphan blocks mined increases, which would reduce minor profits and encourage them to centralize further to, uh, to recover the lost revenue. That, that would be bad, oh yeah. Happily, there's an easy solution. If we use pay to script hash or SegWit pay to witness script hash, we only see the full script at the point when the output is being spent when we can remove the output from the UTXO set. Did you get that? So when we spend the UTXO, it is no longer a UTXO. Thus, it is no longer in the database. Thus, the additional bytes no longer matter. This is somewhat inferior to pay to script hash due to the limiting scripts of 510 bytes, but pay to witness script hash fixes that problem and restores the earlier limits of 10,000 bytes. So what's the security reason why we require complex scripts today use pay to script hash? For the upgrade case, there are some opcodes we don't want people using. Most notably, these are opcodes that might be redefined in the future. For example, op no op x opcode that has been used for soft forks in the past, like op like n op one became op checks block time verify, op no op two became op checks sequence verify, 
And lately, Bitcoin Core 0.16.1 has stopped reeling of op code separator in non-segwit preparation for another potential soft fork that will reduce some lingering problems with expensive verification. In those cases, the standard transactions forbid both the script pubkey and the redeem script paid to, to script hash versions and, and, and whenever applicable, the segwit paid to witness script pay it to witness script hash version. So the ease circumvention isn't possible in this case. Again, phenomenal answer by David Harding. And thank you very much for being such an active and prevalent contributor uh, to our Bitcoin community. Notable commits. And that's the last point here uh, on the Bitcoin Optech newsletter. A quick look at recent merges and commits made in various open source Bitcoin projects. Bitcoin Core. If you start Bitcoin Core with the option flag, avoid partial spends. The wallet will by default spend all outputs received to the same address whenever any one of them would be spent. This, this prevents two outputs of the same address from being spent in separate transactions, which is a common way addresses reuse reduces privacy. The downside is that in many that in the downside is that it may make transactions larger than the smallest they need to be. Bitcoin businesses using Bitcoin Core's built-in wallet who don't need the extra privacy may still want to toggle this flag on when fees are low to, a, to automatic consolidation of related inputs. L&D commit. Updates is estimates for the size of on-chain transactions to prevent transactions from accidentally paying too low a fee uh, and getting stuck. This commit may be interesting for anyone wondering about the size of the transaction and parts of the transaction produced in the current protocol. Another L&D commit is that the daemon no longer looks for spends in the memory pool. It waits for them to be a confirmed part of the block first. This allows the same code to work on full nodes like Bitcoin Core and BTCD, as well as on BIP 157, that's Neutrino based lightweight clients that don't have access to unconfirmed transactions. That is part of the ongoing effort to help people without full nodes using LND. So again, BIP 157 is the Neutrino client, which only gives the inverse Golom rice filters of the already existing and confirmed transactions. So these Neutrino wallets do not see unconfirmed transactions. In several commits, C Lightning developers have mostly completed the transaction from handling peer related functions in Gossip D to handle them in Channel D and Connect D as appropriate. C Lightning has also improved its secret handling so that secrets and signatures are always generated and stored by a separate daemon than the parts of the system directly connected to the network. Peers, you have to subscribe to the newsletter. Optech is the one-stop solution where you can accumulate dense but really, really approachable uh, information about Bitcoin. And this, again, was a rather large episode and uh, we packed a lot of information into this one. So it might be worth uh, to re-watch it and to re-read this Optech newsletter because I'm telling you now, this is my third or fourth reread of all these newsletters. And the more I take in this information, the more it supports my understanding it, uh, which is, of course, the path of achieving ultimate wisdom in Bitcoin. So Piers, as always, thank you for sticking with me. Thank you for accumulating this information and building up the knowledge base of Bitcoin uh, and actually doing the good work that is required in order to understand Bitcoin fully. Thank you very much again for the Bitcoin Optech Group for providing this 
in, like treasure. It's a treasure of information and it helps me a lot. And I hope it helps you as well. Pierce, thank you very much for joining and see you on the next show. Bye-bye.